So we're going to go through a few different topics. Uh, we're going to very quickly go over what is the metaverse. And don't worry if you don't quite get it right off the bat. We're going to have a few examples and see, uh, see what's kind of a, a precursor to the metaverse. There's kind of lots of different opinions on do we have a metaverse now? How close are we? And we're gonna we're gonna be able to to see at least uh, some some variants of uh, what that might look like. We're gonna talk about why it's accelerating, why it's the time now to be talking about the metaverse. If uh, you've been following tech publications, uh, venture capital, all of those areas, that the word metaverse has been popping up a lot lately. There's two different ways into the metaverse uh, opportunity, I would say. One is kind of from the gaming and social side, and the other is like the enterprise side with digital twin and some others. So we're going to go through that and just going to try to learn a bit more about who's in the group, what, uh, what we can do to help connect people, help learn. And uh, just uh, after the event, we'll even try like a brief, uh, a brief chat. We'll turn off the recording and uh, just see uh, see who's uh, who's in the group, what they're looking to learn, anything they need help with, anything they in turn can help with. So uh, yeah, we put uh, we put our slide up and out of the poll, quite a quite a good uh, quite a good grouping here of uh, people who are developers, people who are potential investors, artists, product marketing, gamers. So Really great to see we have kind of a cross section of, uh, of people. And if you haven't uh, filled in the poll already, you can definitely still uh, put that in and do it. And uh, we'll, we'll learn later who's, uh, who's in the group for that. A lot of people have their own definition of the metaverse and it's really hard to get something succinct. So this is a bit wordy, but from things that I've read and, and learned from others, I would define it as something that's a persistent virtual world where humans have an embodied telepresence or avatar and they're able to immerse interactively, uh, immersively interact with content and each other in a digital experience and economy. So the, the metaverse is kind of a parallel yet also inter, intertwined world with our own worlds. And if you started looking into the metaverse and then you'll see coming up a lot is Matthew Ball. So he's a VC, he actually has a, a fund that's an ETF that tries to collect companies now that are working on different aspects of the metaverse and will also be updated in the future certainly. And I'll just hit a few of these topics to give some more color to a full view of the metaverse and kind of why many people say that it's something that we're looking towards but we don't have yet. So a metaverse is persistent, so it doesn't reset, it doesn't pause when you're asleep or not there. It, uh, it's always going on, whether you're personally there or not. And it, it keeps going synchronously and live. So you don't have some notion of like a, like a game season or like a, all of a sudden things restart. It's going, uh, it's going on its own pace. And there's no cap to concurrent users. We've seen kind of uh, MMOs, massively multiplayer online games that were able to have a lot of people, but it wasn't everybody. There were still sort of server shards or groupings where you had a hundred, a thousand, however many people, where it wasn't everybody. Whereas uh, in Matthew Ball's definition, the metaverse is, is one instance. It has a fully functional economy. And it's, it's not just an economy that's driven by one company. So there's individuals who can take part in the economy, there's businesses, and there's different uh, jobs and work in the metaverse. So you can create different content, you can create experiences, you can sell them, you can be an investor in certain aspects of it and gain appreciation from it. And the experience spans digital and physical worlds. And we've seen some people talk about a metaverse in terms of augmented reality, which is kind of a one-to-one -one experience with the physical world. Like everything is an overlay, sort of like Pokemon Go. Or uh, if, you, if you've seen uh, really any NFL or, or soccer game in the last few years, uh, you see that there's uh, on, even on the TV, there's ads that are on the sidelines that are fully digital. There's where the, the 
the first down line is all that is overlaid. That would be like an AR version of a, of a metaverse experience. And then the VR version is when you can actually see the, uh, see the complete view of it through a, a VR headset, for example. And then you're kind of turning the dial fully to the virtual side. Interoperability, this is a key one in terms of are we, do we have a metaverse yet? So this is something that we are going to be digging in further in this talk. So in Matthew Ball's view, you need to have interoperability of, of your data, your, your assets, all of your items between different areas of this metaverse. So you don't kind of start in one place and go to another one and all of a sudden like your the way your avatar looks is totally different or things you had in one and aren't there anymore. And lastly, the content and experiences are created by a range of people. So it's not just one company or a couple companies, it's individuals that create content. It's maybe even guilds or groupings of individuals. So all of these are aspects of, of a, a metaverse experience. And if you've read uh, Snow Crash or read Ready Player One or seen Ready Player One, those are other takes on the metaverse that a lot of people mention just to give you a feel for, for what it may look like. So why now? Why are we talking about this now? So a lot of enabling technology and behaviors have come, uh, come about that really make this a possibility to even be realis realistically saying we're approaching a metaverse. So there's uh, compute that we've had the, the raw computing power to actually do the calculations to manage content, manage worlds, experiences. The 3D rendering has gotten very good for immersive experiences, whether it's on a screen or in VR or AR. Cloud scaling, so we can actually effectively be able to add more processing power and add it, have a, a lot of people on an experience. Bandwidth aspects, whether it's fiber to the home, cable broadband, 5G, that's a uh, making that making a splash now starlink satellite all those things are are very exciting that really make things uh, look look more possible the blockchain is something that really adds a lot of useful properties in terms of especially ownership of items that could be part of your metaverse as well as having the ability to do voting and governance and that's probably an area we're going to dig into in, in further further talks as well and, and lastly, the pandemic in terms of whether for a short amount of time or a long amount of time or recurring people, people being in their homes and coming up with some social and work experiences that, that are not in person. And on the right side, we're looking at kind of the evolution of, of gaming and some different ways that people have been structuring their business models there. So we talked a little about MMOs. There's just massive games, lots of people online. Free to play is a big evolution in that. What that allows is a lot of players to be there and provide a social experience without the friction of everyone having to pay right away. So people can try it out. They can have lots of choice and other players to interact with because that barrier is lower. And lastly, play to earn is something fairly new where you're not just in the game playing for free, you are actually able to transact in the game economy in some way. And we're going to cover that some more later. So mentioned earlier, there's two starting points in the metaverse. We're going to first hit gaming and social. And really, what is it about gaming and social that that had uh, anything to do with the metaverse? It's it's really a technology involved in the games. The realistic 3D engines, the spatial audio, all those things have uh, really been impressive and a good starting point to the point where it's not just games that, uh, that are able to be done now. So if we, if we look at some example experiences, this is from the game Fortnite, but this is like now a social event. This is a concert. Uh, Travis Scott had millions of people online viewing his concert and made millions of dollars. And everything you see going on here, the people that are dancing on the roof and dressed up in all sorts of fun outfits, doing moves, like those are actual people in the game. Like each one of those is a person who is uh, enjoying this concert and uh, 
having a, having a good time and being part of like this group immersive experience. And it's not just game engines. So Wave XR is a company that also specializes in kind of immersive online events. And again, you'll see that this is kind of like a, a DJ concert experience and people are kind of interacting and jumping around and playing with these orbs. So it's, it's really quite a, quite a different experience than what we're used to seeing online. And this, these are things that happen already. This isn't like the future or maybe. So what are some opportunities based on those events? So you can imagine things from kind of live event and movies and film are able to carry over and be opportunities as well. So if you're a director or producer of one of these experiences, you can now do that for an immersive online event, sound engineer, 3D artists, visual effects, people working in VR, lighting, motion capture actors to, to gather gather the, the data to actually make a character move in a very specific manner, uh, other designers. So all these are opportunities that are, are, are kind of shaping and coming together now. I'm gonna show a few more examples. So these are some other gaming worlds. And for Roblox, this is someone that put together a lot of uh, detailed architectural views. So even though this is a, a gaming engine, they are able to create kind of these fun experiences, futuristic homes, get a feel for, for the fact that these engines are not just for games, you can do a lot more with them. And the city of Helsinki, Finland created Virtual Helsinki. So they made uh, this uh, immersive experience where you could see parts of the city. You can actually go in and uh, visit, visit a museum that's part of this event and sort of feel uh, feel more part of it, do some virtual tourism even. So that's uh, that's something fun that can, uh, can be done now too. So we've seen a few of these companies that have been mentioned. So we have Epic, which is a private company and it's a $29 billion uh, valuation right now. So they were that Fortnite game that Travis Scott performed in and uh, Ariel Grande performed in as well. And they raised a billion dollars to fund metaverse initiatives and Roblox, where we saw the ex example there of the architectural space, they actually let users create games and it's a lot of actually young people kids creating games so they're uh, they're a big part of this as well so this is already big business and these companies are looking to see what else they can do to keep going past gaming past social experiences and go towards a metaverse here's another example so this is a conference that because of covid had to take place remotely this is the ieee vr conference at georgia tech and they actually modeled the experience of uh, being at the university. So they use Mozilla Hubs, which is a free platform, and people have avatars, and they can kind of walk by posters, walk by presentations, walk by videos. So it's something uh, something a little different, but uh, another kind of experience that is is already being tried and kind of on the horizon as well for more. So let's talk about some uh, virtual creator economies. There's a variety of experiences and it can be anything from like a 2D isometric view, kind of like a, an RPG style from my 8 and 16 bit days, all the way to a 3D voxel style, which is kind of more of a Minecraft uh, type style, or uh, all the way to 3D, including VR. So all of these are, are experiences that are kind of more, more social and immersive. And you'll note that each of them are avatar experiences where you have a 2D, a 3D, or a, this voxel avatar that represents you as you explore the world. So I'm going to show this example from Sandbox. So this is a company that 
much like uh, Roblox lets you create your own games. And uh, they do a few neat things. So you actually can purchase a digital piece of land in their site and then build things on it. They have a, a building tool and you can build experiences and have other people in the game sort of attend your, uh, your house party. And you can come up with all sorts of game experiences. Uh, someone made a concert and they also are integrated with the blockchain in this case where you can create items that other game creators can buy and use in their games. So pretty varied what you can do. And these are kind of a few options they have. We're talking about kind of the economy in the metaverse. They have a number of ways you can, you can make money playing the game or just be a consumer and uh, enjoy playing other people's games. Atari symbol there. So, so some uh, big companies have already bought land, so to say, in this game to, to build experiences. So what, what are we talking about in terms of economic models? So the platforms make money uh, often with free to play systems where you don't have to pay to be part of the game, but you can pay for what your avatar looks like or items or things like that. Or there can be subscriptions. So the platforms can make money in like a, a, a B2C aspect. The platforms can also sell items directly to the players or they can take a cut of other creators on the platform. So the creators can uh, create some sort of special sword or item or costume and sell it. And the platform can take uh, a cut of that. So it's, it's both a B2C and a B2B economy. And the creators, this is where kind of a play to earn can also take, take place. So they can create and sell those objects. They can sell access to their, their land for that in-game experience. And there's many platforms, the ones that are on blockchain also can take advantage of a token appreciation if there's a token as part of the game and that's that has some sort of a exchange rate. Uh, there's also more advanced forms with the DeFi staking and other ways that can be uh, making money on a blockchain. So a little bit more on play to earn. I, I got this from Piers Kicks who found these Twitter posts about Axie Infinity, so this is pretty popular play to earn game and it's popular overseas as well. And uh, there's one person talking that he made a equivalent of, of $7.78 in less than an hour, which in, in some cases is, is more than, than people get paid in the US. And then a person replied that in the Philippines, they made 7,000 pesos, which is much more significant for that country even than 778 in the US. So there's definitely some interesting economic dynamics taking place in these in these game worlds. So there's opportunities to be a creator, to be a player. Uh, there's all sorts of kind of economic aspects of, uh, of these emerging experiences. So the players can make money by winning and sort of in-game contests. They can buy items and resell them. They can buy kind of raw inputs sometimes items are crafted or, or nfts are made from different parts and you either win or buy the parts and put them together in some combination that makes them worth more uh, there's also kind of affiliates uh, that's always a model to to work on and again the blockchain specific ways to to make money so let's take a look at a couple of examples so these are two items i found on a store so this is this blue dragon and he's got some attributes that are assigned. So he's got a power attribute. The price in the game token is $7.35 and equivalent is $5.49. And you'll see that you're not just buying a static picture, you're buying a 3D model that's rigged and has animations. So rigged means there's control points and you're able to 
make this design actually move. So someone who's the artist for this took the time to make all these animations and you can buy this and make it part of your game world. And then you have this dragon that you can put, uh, put into your game. So this one, there are 1500 for sale because it's an NFT. They can set exactly how many are available and 441 were sold. So 400 or 400 sold at $5. This, this was uh, a few thousand dollars. Another option, this is a, a green dragon where it's literally only one ever. So this dragon was set at a price at over $8,000. And you can consider this in economic terms, uh, a Veblen good, which people like to buy things because it's a, it's a status symbol. You can know that you're one of the one or the few who has something like this. And interestingly, the higher the price, the more exciting it is to be in, a, in the club. So this is another, another model to make money. So you can make money by making reasonably priced items and sell a lot of them or you can make very high priced items and make them more exclusive. And both, both those, both those are, are certainly valid. And last example, this is from a, a different game called Neon District. This one's a, again, a, a $4 item, has a number of properties. So you can use these in the game for, uh, for for play purposes, it has an attack rate, uh, defense, boosts, all these other things. So again, you can have commodity versions of these items or you can have the expensive versions. So this reminded me of something from Christopher Jantz of Point Nine Capital a few years back. He wrote five ways to build a hundred million dollar business. And essentially you can, he, he likened it to like different animals. So uh, for an elephant, you maybe have a small number of customers and you charge them each a lot of money all the way down to a fly where this is probably more where you're looking at for like a free to play type gaming or other systems like that or freemium models where you have millions of customers and you charge them very little in aggregate but because you have millions you're able to make a lot so all of these the end result is a hundred million in his example but they're kind of very different approaches in what you do in your business and how you put that system together. And if we apply this to uh, what we saw with uh, the game goods, we can have our green and blue dragon here and our knife and those map in a, in a similar manner. So you can, you can create these items and set a price point and then promote them or set up your business in a manner that makes sense based on how you're trying to do it. So uh, someone asked a question about the game Sandbox. So I, I'm not sure what level of imports can take place in Sandbox. A lot of these systems have proprietary editors. Sometimes they let you import 3D formats, sometimes they, they don't. Um, we're actually gonna look into tooling a bit as opportunities well later. And that, that's right now, tooling, creator tools. So I'll show another example of a game editor. So this is from the core game. So Core is trying to be a kind of older, older version of Roblox. So Roblox has a lot of younger kids and kind of simpler graphics. And the, the Core system tries to make kind of more 3D games, more like shooter type games. And they have a 3D editor where they let you kind of set up the game world, put in objects, set textures, go through all the different things. So that's another opportunity because there's there's different systems and they're not really uh, really compatible. A lot of a lot of systems have their own builders. And there's some early views of tools that are across systems. So this one is uh, actually really neat from Adobe. It's called Adobe Character Animator. And you'll see this a cartoon girl moving and then when we zoom out you see there's actually a guy uh, just looking at his webcam and uh, everything he's doing is uh, being translated to the character moving. So the character has articulation points and through uh, through machine learning and object recognition, kind of like the Xbox Connect, but way more powerful, he's able to just do his moves and then the character does it. So it's it's motion capture 
without having uh, to wear like a special suit and all these special like uh, little control points. So really pretty cool. That's uh, on the horizon and Adobe's uh, showing this now. And this site, Ready Player Me, lets you upload your own picture and create an avatar. And they do let you export a model format that you can use in uh, Mozilla Hubs and uh, some other games. So they are not kind of tied direct to a platform. Their intent is to let you create your own avatar and then reuse it in other places. And you can customize your, your clothes, your hair, uh, your objects that you have on you, all sorts of things. And they even have an API so that if you want to build your own game and have, a, have an avatar in your game, instead of building this whole system, you can uh, take advantage of theirs. So definitely opportunity for developers and, and artists to create more of these tools that work across worlds and uh, help people make these experiences. So what are what are the content gaps do we have? So there's remastering. So we've seen a lot of 2D NFTs now. And because the market's getting crowded, people are starting to, to think about what else can we do with them other than like look at the picture set as our profile. So people are trying to make uh, make games with the NFTs, make the NFTs part of virtual worlds. And often that comes with actually creating a 3D version of the NFT. So it has to be uh, models. In this case, it's this gorilla and kind of the voxel style, like a Roblox or that sandbox game. And it has to be rigged. So rigged means you set up control points, just how you saw in the Adobe video, where on his video, there were little light up uh, lines and dots, green, green and white lines and dots. Those are mapped to control points. And that's how you use to move the control points. And then the software essentially interpolates a more realistic motion for how to make that character actually, uh, actually move. So another opportunity for artists, they can help various projects go from uh, 2D to, to remaster in 3D. Value transferability. I think this is a big spot and this goes back to Matthew Ball's view of of a metaverse being interoperable and, and instead like where we are now. There's different types of value you can put on items. An item can be purely artistic value or collectible. It could be vanity, like you you wear it because you, you like how it makes you look. Could be social capital, uh, like a crypto punk because you were early and now you're in this elite club of having one either because you were early or because you had a lot of money and were able to buy one. But are people trying to do more? So they're trying to add utility to these NFTs and so they, you actually do more with them. So an NFT may allow you to have access to a, a certain club or a certain event. Uh, Gary V, v fans NFTs, he has an event for those. There's a lot of people making NFTs that let you into certain experiences. There's Discord bots that will uh, let you win when you have certain coins. There's there's a lot going on there. Investment is a tricky one right now because crypto and securities and is it an asset or not, but all that aside, people do sometimes buy collectibles and art as an investment and expect it to go up in value. So that's certainly another type of value you can get from some of these in-game items and and uh, things in virtual worlds. And also uh, things I've been seeing also coming around is uh, people buying NFTs as part of a, a donation to support a various, various causes. It's sort of uh, something you can, you can hold to remind you that you're supporting a cause. And all of these types of values are not mutually exclusive, but they are hard to actually all do today with the protocols and interop we have between these gains, which is often zero or very, very little. So there's opportunities to work on aspects of blockchain and, and other protocols to get, get more done in this spot. And if you want to have a take on a utility and why people buy things, if you think about someone who buys fine art, what, what would they do with it? Maybe you think they put it in their house and they can look at it every day. And that's one type of person. 
Another type of person takes it and puts it in this drab building called a freeport. So because of tax considerations, freeports often on airport land, you do not have to pay the same taxes as you would pay if you actually brought them in country. So if someone's buying art just as an investment, not to enjoy it in their home, uh, it would go in that building. So definitely a good panel to keep in mind about why people buy things and making sure you're matching the value and types of value they can get to what they're actually looking to do. So as I mentioned, it's an opportunity because there are content islands everywhere. You can't take your Roblox content and put it in Fortnite or vice versa and go across all these things. There's opportunities to, to help make this better. And this problem exists even on the same blockchain. You can have two games on the same Ethereum blockchain and still run into this. And I'll give you another real world example. Let's say you're in New York City, get yourself a top of the line Tesla P100D, you're driving around outside outside the city, zero to 62, two and a half seconds, super exciting. And then you cross over into New Jersey and you're immediately stopped and uh, your car stays in New Jersey. And instead they give you this, uh, this nice little picture that tells you, I, I own this car. I, I used to be cool in, in New York, but I'm in, I'm in New Jersey now. And all I, all I gotta show is this picture. That's, that's unfortunately kind of the situation today even if uh, you have an NFT on the same blockchain, if you have a virtual world where this buying this Tesla NFT means you can also drive it in the world and uh, use it in that aspect. If you go to a different world, maybe you get nothing, maybe you can still prove you own it, but you don't get all the utility. So that's, that's something that we're still figuring out in the space. So what is... Uh, what is the opportunity here? Interoperability. There's multiple groups working on interoperability, alliances, partnership standards. The biggest players, uh, I would say Epic and Roblox are in that group of biggest players worth billions of dollars. They're making billions of dollars with their worlds kind of as is, but they are keeping an eye on interoperability as well. Uh, Epic is working on it between their own games and I can't say for sure what they're doing internally, but I'd imagine they're at least giving some thought to interoperability outside of their games. And uh, a reason for that is this, this company Kodak, which you may have heard of, they were making a ton of money on film-based processing. And they also had an early lead in digital SLR camera technology. And what did they do? Well, they're making a lot of money with the film and the digital camera was like expensive at the time and maybe people weren't ready and they weren't the ones that brought digital cameras to the masses and eventually they filed for bankruptcy. So you can be making a ton of money one day, five years later, you could be, you could be bankrupt. Uh, the world is changing at an incredible pace and I, I would say even some of the big companies today that are making a lot of money on their closed worlds I don't think they should be resting. They should probably be figuring out when, uh, when interoperability will be a must. Going on to the enterprise and digital twin side, I'm gonna show a quick video from, uh, from Microsoft, not to, not to give them an ad, but just because uh, I thought they did a, a nice job uh, showing this. that is bound to the physical world in real time that we can experience in mixed reality that we can collaborate with that we can run simulations on and find what is important to us that we can apply ai to learn predict and act to save time and money to reduce carbon to preserve natural resources to improve safety to bring us all closer this is already happening today. Across the world, organizations are taking advantage of this new wave of innovation that trends to an interconnectedness that enables the metaverse. Everything modeled in the metaverse mirrors the status of its physical twin, including the interactions and relations between everything else. So they kind of started talking about this, where the metaverse can start off being something for industrial use 
where you're looking to understand how some very complex physical machinery or transportation supply chain or anything like that is working. And much like blockchain, where you can have a public blockchain with everybody, I would say you could have the public metaverse for enterprise be part of uh, the social gaming and uh, the rest of the metaverse. Or they might have like a, a private version where they're doing early testing or they're just doing proprietary investigation where they, they don't need interaction with the rest of the people as part of it. So what, what else can you do with these systems? They mentioned digital twins to be able to, to model things. Uh, they can look at IoT devices and how sensors and other things interact. There's a lot going on in this space and Microsoft has made a, a big jump into it. Google has recently announced that they're doing supply chain work. And uh, I attended a presentation from Alex Lee, who was also looking into this space for the metaverse. And I'll, I'll include that in the, the post email follow up too, because uh, he showed a lot of opportunities there as well. So one more thing, uh, so the Omniverse is kind of NVIDIA's view of the metaverse, and they are focused on, in this aspect, on something called sim to real So sim to real is taking a robot and training that robot inside a simulated environment so that it could have a safer space to kind of do some early learning. And then eventually, once it's gotten far enough in that, see how well that transfers over to the real world. So this is kind of another enterprise metaverse opportunity that's uh, that's coming around. Lastly, there's uh, there's government involvement. So, Estonia, for example, has an e-residency where you could create a European company uh, fully online without actually being there. Imagine if they let you lease virtual real estate in, uh, in like the Estonia metaverse. You could have a, a storefront in, in virtual Estonia part of the, of the world. Smart cities, we saw virtual Helsinki. Uh, governments are doing a lot of work in simulations to try to optimize the physical world. And in terms of sustainability, if you're buying items in the, the real world and consuming a lot versus the digital items, there's a uh, there's less of an impact on resources for digital items. Uh, blockchain aside, there's uh, there's work to make even blockchain based digital items less resource intensive, and I'm sure that'll be uh, something that can be solved as well.